we can see that using the binomial formula and the properties of the binomial distribution, we can calculate probabilities, means, variances, and standard deviations directly. In this section, we will be covering the binomial distribution. Actually, before we get into the binomial distribution, let's start with what a Bernoulli experiment is. You see, a Bernoulli experiment is an experiment where we have a single trial of something for which there are only two possible outcomes. Think about the roulette wheel example. When we spill the wheel once, we have two outcomes. It's either a success or a failure. Sure, we have 38 pockets, but really all we care about is winning, and so we have defined that to be exactly two outcomes. It's a success or a failure. That's exactly what a Bernoulli experiment is. It's that experiment where we have only two possible outcomes, something we define as success, depending on what we care about, and the opposite of that, which is going to be a failure. Which brings us to a binomial distribution. A binomial distribution is what we get when we sum up the number of successes across independent Bernoulli distributions. For example, if I were to toss a coin five times and count at the sum of heads, what I have is a binomial distribution. And then finally, as another example is if we simply count the number of winning lottery tickets out of five total tickets that we buy, then we also have a binomial distribution. So it's a fantastic distribution that covers so many experiments that we have. As a recap, we should have independent Bernoulli trials. We have a notion of the number of trials that we want, which actually we're going to denote by N, and then on each trial, we have a notion of success or failure. So in fact, one more parameter that we need for that distribution is the probability of success on each independent Bernoulli trial. So that brings us to the probability mass function or PMF of the binomial distribution. As you see on screen, all these examples that we've talked about, as it turns out, they have the same form for the probability mass function, PMF, of the random variables. In fact, we have that f of x is equal to n choose x, the probability of success raised to the power of x, multiplied by 1 minus p, which is the probability of failure on any given trial, raised to the number of n minus x. But why does the binomial formula work that way? Well, before we get into that, let's actually look at what different binomial distributions look like. Actually, let's take a step back and look at what different Bernoulli distributions look like. See, when P, which is a probability of success, is equal to 0.1, then we basically just have a histogram with two values. Our random variable can only be a failure or a success which for us means zero if it's a failure and one if it's a success. And so what we have are these two bars which we see on screen, the first one representing the probability of failure and the second one representing the probability of success, which is x is equal to one. We can do the same thing for three more values of p as you see on screen now. So that's what the Bernoulli distribution looks like. What about the binomial? The binomial is just the Bernoulli distribution ramped up to be at least one trial. And so again, on screen, we can see how different binomial distributions look like, depending on what the value of P is. Again, remember that P is a probability of success. So for example, when we look at a binomial distribution with N, the number of trials, equal to 10, and we set the probability of success on each trial to be equal to 0.5, which is a half, that what we have is first 
X can take on values ranging from zero, which means no successes, all the way up to 10, which means all our trials result in successes. And so with P equal to 0.5, then we have a PMF that looks like what we have on screen right now, where the most possible value is actually five. That makes sense. If the probability of success is a half and I spin my roulette wheel 10 times, then I should see five successes. So the value that's most likely should be five. Again, which you can see on the histogram we have on screen. We can look at different values of P for the same value of N, and you can start to get an idea of the values that are very possible. If the probability of success is very low, close to 0.1, then we expect to see low values of X, which means we expect to see more failures than successes. If the probability of success is very high, then we expect to see higher values of X just as we have on screen. So that brings us back to the question, why does the binomial formula even work? Let's go back to our relate wheel example. If we spin the wheel three times, then again, the possible values for X are zero, one, two, and three. Well, you see zero and three only really have one option. That's going to be failure on all three trials or success on all three trials. However, in the middle, we have different choices. For example, if X is equal to one, which means one success in three trials, then our options are success on the first trial and failures on the next two trials, or failure on the first trial, success on the middle trial, and failure on the last one. Or finally, success on the last trial, but failure on the first two. What you will quickly notice is in all three cases, we have exactly one success. And so when we calculate the probability that we have exactly X is equal to one, our probability, no matter what the scenario is, is probability of one success, which is P, multiplied by probability of two failures, which is one minus P raised to the power of two. However, there are three choices, like I said before. So even though they have three, the same probabilities, there are actually three different arrangements of the success and failures so that we then have to do combinations. That's where the final piece of the binomial formula is from. So to review again, our binomial formula is n choose x, p to the power of x, one minus p to the power of n minus x. n choose x tells us how many different arrangements we have for picking x successes in n failures. P to the power of X tells us the probability of success raised to the number of actual successes. And one minus P raised to N minus X tells us the probability of failure raised to the power of the actual number of failures, which is N minus X. So now that we understand why the binomial formula works, let's try to use it. For each trial, we have two outcomes like we talked about we have a success and a failure. And also we have a concept of the number of trials. And finally, we have independence across those trials. So what we're going to do is use the binomial formula and then compare our answer to what we had before. So again, we want to know what the probability of having exactly two successes is in three trials. For us using the binomial formula, that means we have three choose two multiplied by the probability of success, which is 18 over 38 raised to the power of two, two successes, multiplied by the probability of failure, which is 20 over 38 raised to the power of the actual number of failures, which is three minus two, which is equal to one. Now we can take n equals 15 trials or even more and compute the probabilities quite easily. For example, 
What is the probability of having exactly four successes in 15 trials? We can plug it into the binomial formula where n, the number of trials is 15, and x, the number of successes we want to calculate is equal to four. That's going to give us approximately 0 0.0590. So now we know what the binomial distribution is. We know what the binomial formula is, so we can compute exact probabilities. That's fantastic. But what are the properties of this distribution? It would be nice to also be able to calculate means, variances, and standard deviations directly without using the table like we did before. Well, you guessed right. Turns out that if you have a binomial distribution, the mean, variance, and standard deviation have very standard forms. The mean, which is also the expected value, which is also the expectation of x, is just n multiplied by p. That's the number of trials multiplied by the probability of success. That's on average the value of x, our random variable, that we will expect to see if we run this experiment many, many, many times. Also, the variance takes a very standard form. That's just n multiplied by p multiplied by 1 minus p. That's the number of trials multiplied by the probability of success multiplied by the probability of failure, which means our standard deviation, which is just the square root of variance, is exactly the square root of n multiplied by p multiplied by 1 minus p. Okay, so now that we know how to calculate the mean, variance, and standard deviation from the binomial distribution directly, let's use that again for our roulette wheel example. Well, if we spin the wheel three times, then n is equal to three. And so, using the formula for the binomial distribution, our mean is just n multiplied by p. Our n is three, and the p is the probability of success, which is 18 over 38, which is equal to 1.42, just like we had before. That's much easier, isn't it? We can do the same thing for variance and standard deviation. First, our variance is n multiplied by p multiplied by 1 minus p, where n is just 3. p is 18 over 38, and 1 minus p is 20 over 38, which gives us approximately 0 0.75. And then finally, the standard deviation using the binomial formula directly, is the square root of n, p, and 1 minus p, which for us is the square root of 3, 18 over 38, and 20 over 38, which gives us approximately 0 0.86. So now we know what the binomial distribution is. We know what binomial random variables are. And in fact, we can see that using the binomial formula and the properties of the binomial distribution, we can calculate probabilities, means, variances, and standard deviations directly, as long as we have an experiment that we can define in the context of Bernoulli experiments. There is no reason why everyone and have access to the very best education. Welcome to Calculus One. To introduction to astronomy. The introduction to philosophy. To statistics. Microeconomics. Psychology. Let's get started.